Good evening. I'm uh, Peter Starr. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. On behalf of all my colleagues here at, here at AU, I want to welcome you to uh, the, this event, the beginning of the Keystone Lecture to a wonderful symposium on reinventing Israel, transformations of Israeli society in the 21st century. I want to especially welcome all our speakers from Israel and around the United States who've come from, from far and wide to join us for this symposium. Uh, the Center for Israel Studies, as some, many of you know, is really a point of pride. It's something in which we at American University have extraordinary pride. It's one of the first, if not the first, Center for Israel Studies in the United States, founded in 1998, uh, inaugurated by Shimon Peres. It's an interdisciplinary center that's housed in our unit, the College of Arts and Sciences, but that takes advantage of all the faculty strength uh, and student interest across all of American university schools and colleges, including obviously the School of International Service, whose digs we're happy enough to be in tonight. Uh, the center does many things. It sponsors Israel Studies classes in a broad array of areas. It takes two students to Israel on field trips. It organizes over two dozen public events every year, extraordinary public events with turnouts like this uh, nearly every time. It includes lectures, conferences, dance performances, music performances, art exhibits. I'm particularly fond of the uh, Rothfeld collection of Israeli art that Don Rothfeld gave us a couple of years ago that had an extraordinary opening in the AE Museum and that we'll be taking on the road shortly. This, as I mentioned, is a third of a series of outstanding conferences, academic conferences. We have other conferences as well on Israel uh, done by the Center. Uh, 2013, Israel Studies and Jewish Studies in America. 2014, How Jewish is the Jewish State, Religion and Society in Israel. And, you know, as Israel keeps transforming itself in wonderful ways, so does Israel Studies. And we're very proud of the fact that our Center for Israel Studies is really on the cutting edge of these transformations. <coughs> so with that, I'd like to give special thanks to our Jewish Studies program for helping to bring some of our scholars here to this event and introduce the Abenson Chair in Israel Studies, who went somewhere, Michael Brenner. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Peter Starr for his warm welcome and his continued support. Um, I would say, speaking for the whole university, uh, the center really feels this is a place where it is very strongly supported. I'm very grateful to the many supporters of the center who are here. I'm especially happy to welcome Lillian Abenson. Um, very happy she's here, as always. I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of the Knapp Family Foundation for this conference and to recognize the cooperation with the Jewish Studies Program with Pam Nadell co-host of this conference. And as always, I'd like to thank Laura Cutler, who is, Cutler is busy outside, as always, uh, and her wonderful team of student interns who all work very hard to make this happen. Finally, I want to welcome our conference speakers and also our faculty, our junior faculty <laughs> guests from all around the world, from Europe, the United States, Egypt, um, and Israel who joined us for this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, when Theodor Herzl wrote his utopian novel, Alt Neuland, or Old Newland, in 1902, he had, a wonderful, he had many wonderful ideas. But one of the wonderful ideas was, as he said, every 25 years, a fine modern steamer called the Futuro would visit the Jewish state. On board, so Herzl thought, on board were 500 ladies and gentlemen who belonged to the intellectual aristocracy of the whole civilized world. These 500 philosophers, inventors, explorers, politicians, economists, architects, scientists, and journalists of all nations and all religions were a kind of a jury which would evaluate the achievements of Herzl's new society of Old Newland during their six week stay. While still on board, these eminent minds discussed the most urgent questions of the world, which would later be printed and become a gem of world literature 
known as the New Platonic Dialogues, so Herzl. Once in the Jewish state, they were to judge its achievements and to give advice about its further development. The leaders of Herzl's Jewish state, again, this is from Old Newland, agreed to act according to the guidelines of this international jury. Now imagine for a moment the Futuro landing at the port of Haifa today. What would they see? Well, Israel is not the seven-hour land Herzl dreamed about. He thought it would be, and he actually drew a, a flag with seven stars for the seven working days. That's why he called it the seven-hour land. Nor is it the peaceful place where, as he thought, the army would stay in its barracks and the rabbis in their synagogues. <laughs> but the Futurist passengers would be stunned by a modern and highly technologized society often referred to as the startup nation. They would see an impressive Tel Aviv skyline and they would hear people stemming from about a hundred different countries speaking in or often shouting at each other <laughs> in Hebrew. Would the Futuro indeed return to Israel every 25 years as he thought? Its esteemed passengers might not be able to recognize what they had seen in their previous, during their previous visit. Israel keeps reinventing itself. In 1967, Israel experienced what is often called its second founding. With the triumphant victory in the Six Day War, Israel was now a regional power and Jerusalem was finally united under Jewish rule. But with the newly conquered territories, Israel also ruled over a much larger Arab population. This is what gave concern to some people like Israeli philosopher Yeshayahu Leibovitch, who famously claimed that Israel lost the Six Day War on the Seventh Day by not returning most of these territories and thus being in danger of losing its character as a Jewish state. The political climate changed since then beginning with the triumph of the more right-wing parties under Menachem Begin in the 1977 elections. After 1967, and especially after 1977, we observe the decline of the socialist models of the state's early leaders and the growing popularity of more nationalist and more religious ideas. The settler ideal gradually replaced for many, not for all, the kibbutz ideal, the concept of the Holy Land superseded for many the concept of a secular state. Jewish Arab tensions were on the rise, but there were also periods of short lived hope for peace always. During the 1970s, following President Sadat's visit to Jerusalem, and during the 1990s, following the Oslo negotiations and the peace agreements between Israel and the Jordanians and between Israel and the PLO. Shimon Peres back then spoke of the new Middle East in which Israel and the Arab states would be united in their endeavor for a common economic market and political stability. The assassination of Yitzhak Rabin almost exactly 20 years ago and the following intifadas brought these dreams to an end, at least for the time being. Our conference is concerned with the, is with the latest of Israel's reinventions with the period of the last 20 years, which is characterized by three developments, as Calvin Goldscheider, one of our speakers tomorrow, stated in his very recent, excellent book, Israeli Society in the 21st Century. First, the massive immigration by Jews from the former Soviet Union. Second, a new economy shaped both by the high-tech achievements of the startup nation and by the growing gap between rich and poor, and third, the growth of the religious orthodox and ultra-orthodox populations and the religious conflict this development entails. Our conference will look tomorrow at all of these issues plus others, new trends in art and literature, the new self-identification of Israel's Arab population, new potential immigrants among the self-identified lost tribes of Israel from Burma to Burundi, 
and the new Israeli diaspora that has emerged between Berkeley and Berlin. Over a century after Herzl's Altneuland, Hebrew writer Eshkol Nevo published recently a novel called Neuland, Newland. In this novel, Nevo creates a fictitious, what he calls therapeutic community for Israelis traumatized by war and conflict, which is established, of all places, in Baron Hirsch's former agricultural colonies in Argentina, a place Herzl initially considered as a possible alternative location for a Jewish state. There is a certain irony in the fact that Eshkol Nevo is the grandson of one of the founders of Israel, some t at some point Prime Minister Levi Eshkol. Nevo's novel is one of the several books, several books concerned with alternative Israels around the globe. In the meantime, in Israel itself, Many citizens have their own alternative societies in mind. The gap between an increasingly secular Tel Aviv and an increasingly religious Jerusalem is widening before our eyes. The settlers dream of their Eretz Israel of Shlema, of their greater Israel, the Haredim of a state according to the Halakha, to religious law, and the Arab population envisions a state for all its citizens without the ubiquitous presence of Jewish symbols. As we speak, relations between Israel and the Jewish diaspora face new challenges. In Europe, Jews are being attacked as they are identified with the Israeli government. And in the United States, the Jewish community follows with unease the growing distance between the administrations and leaders of the two countries. Two weeks ago, we hosted former Israeli ambassador Michael Oren to share with us his views about the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Many of you remember the lively discussion with now member of Knesset Oren. And today, we are privileged to host one of the leading American voices to tell us more about the specific relationship between Israel and diaspora Jews and specifically also Israel and American Jews. It is a real pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. David Allenson as the keynote speaker of this conference. As president and chancellor of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, Rabbi Allenson was the academic leader of the reform movement in the United States for well over a decade until his retirement last year. As a staunch advocate of Israel engagement, Rabbi Allenson strengthened the Jerusalem campus's programs and outreach to the larger Israeli community of Hebrew Union College. His tenure saw the exponential growth of the Israel rabbinical program, which prepares leaders for Israel's progressive movement synagogues and communities. He expanded the Year in Israel program for the rabbinical, cantorial, and education students. He implemented Israel seminars for graduate students. David Allenson received his PhD from Columbia University in 1981 and was ordained by Hebrew Union College already in 1977. He became a faculty member already back in 1979. His extensive public publications include Tradition in Transition, Orthodoxy, Halakha, and the Boundaries of Modern Jewish History, Rabbi Ezreal Hildesheimer and the Creation of Modern Jewish Orthodoxy, and most recently last year, Jewish Meaning in a World of Choice. After retiring from Hebrew Union College, Dr. Ellenson just started a new career in the field of Israel studies. He was recently appointed director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies and teaches in the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies at Brandeis University. Please join me in welcoming David, em David Ellenson. Thank you. <clears throat> Erev Tov, good evening. Uh, it is a great, great pleasure to be here with you tonight, and I feel very honored to have this position. I want to thank the Dean and you for sponsoring this and having such an evening, and I want to thank Michael and where's Pam Nadell? There you are. Thank you both very, very much for inviting me. It's also a pleasure to see so many colleagues, and I want to thank Laura for 
all her incredible work in making all this possible with her uh, with her staff. It is really a great, great uh, pleasure and honor for me to be here tonight. Uh, I actually had thought a year ago that I was really completely retired uh, from everything in my life, and I don't know quite how to say it. Some of you may know Elon Troen, who was the founding director of the Schusterman Center at Brandeis University. I'd say, just don't be in a room completely alone with him <laughs> if he wants to persuade you to do something. Uh, I came home that night and my wife said, well, how was your meeting with Elon? And I said, well, you won't really believe it, but I'm going to now be the director of the Schusterman Center for uh, Israel Studies at Brandeis. But I'm enjoying it uh, very, very much, and it's sort of a nice chapter uh, in my career. I want to also just begin, though, tonight by making a couple of personal statements. Uh, I will try to be as descriptive and non-normative as possible in talking about this topic that really does deal with the whole relationship that I foresee between particularly diaspora and North American Jews and Israel. But it would be disingenuous of me to pretend that I come to this particular topic with no sensibilities, uh, so to speak, of my own. And I see a number of rabbinic friends, one in particular over here tonight, Rabbi Reiner. Um, I grew up in a home that was uh, very, very devoted to Zionism, and my whole career has been uh, committed to Israel in many ways. It is odd, as Michael indicated when he introduced me, I certainly spent much more time studying German Jewish history. We studied at the same university, and in particular the history of Orthodox Judaism, and halakha, Jewish legal sources. I have done some writings on um, Israeli post scheme, that is to say Israeli legal decisors. Uh, but my interest in Israel or commitment to Israel is not simply, how should I put it, an academic one, though in a moment I will try to be as academic as I can be. Uh, my mother and father were both, as was true of, I think, many American Jews in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, completely committed to the state of Israel. Uh, I took my first trip, and now I'm going to require you to engage in a tremendous act of imagination. You have to first imagine me more than 50 years ago. I was a point guard. <laughs> It's hard for me to believe this, on a junior Maccabee basketball team <laughs> that played in Israel during the 65 Maccabea games. Uh, we won eight, we lost two. I don't know what more to say. Uh, and my life has been intertwined with Israel ever since. I lived one year on a Hashomer Hatzair kibbutz, Mishmar HaEmek, in the Jezreel Valley. Um, I've been a visiting professor at Hebrew University a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Hebrew University, and also a fellow at the Sholem Hartman Institute, where I taught for more than a decade. Uh, I would Im imagine that I've probably made over 100 trips to Israel in my life. We have many Israeli friends. Uh, and so my commitments, and even my talk tonight, uh, stem really from a deeply existential place of commitment to the Jewish state, and I, of course, as is true, I am sure, with everyone here, have a million very, very complicated feelings about the state of Israel and where it stands today and what its policies are, uh, but my commitment certainly remains firm. If you don't walk away with anything else tonight, just know, and I know this will be really a shock, but the state of Israel is actually a complicated case. Uh, <laughs> And there are many, many different ways to look at the state. But what I want to do tonight, and when Michael pressed me for a title, uh, I said, well, from BG to BB, it just struck me as cute, from Ben-Gurion to Prime Minister Netanyahu. And then the question, is this the end of an era in Israel-Jewish relations? And in order to Israel diaspora relations, and in order to address the topic, particularly from an American perspective, 
And perhaps because I'm at Brandeis now, I thought that I would begin with Louis Brandeis. And what I do want to do with you tonight is to take a look at some of these sources in order to frame the points that I wish to make. Uh, my contention will be that the relationship between American Jews and Israel, certainly up until now, has largely been based on the propositions that Louis Brandeis put forth more than 100 years ago. And I've quoted from an article that he wrote in 1912, a pamphlet. And in many ways, the understanding that Justice Brandeis ultimately came to put forth in relationship to Israel and the American diaspora in particular, but the totality of the diaspora in general, I think stems from this particular document, and I'd even make the claim that in large measure, I hope it's okay, that in large measure, this position that Justice Brandeis put forth in 1912 remains, for many American Jews, still the predominant way in which they view Israel diaspora relations. But I'm going to even make the claim that perhaps, and that's really a question, Perhaps this is beginning to unravel in certain ways in light, Michael, of all the different trends that you mentioned in Israeli society today. So let's take a look at what Justice Brandeis wrote. The Zionists seek to establish this home in Palestine because they are convinced that the undying longing of Jews for Palestine is a fact of deepest significance. It is a manifestation of the struggle for the existence by an ancient people which has established its right to live, a people whose 3,000 years of civilization has produced a faith, culture, and identity which enable it to contribute largely in the future, as it has in the past, to the advance of civilization. And that it is not a right merely, but a duty of the Jewish nationality to survive and develop. They believe that only in Palestine can Jewish life be fully protected from the forces of disintegration and a Chad Ha'amist position, that there alone can the Jewish spirit reach its full and natural development. And by securing for those Jews who wish to settle there, those who wish to go, one of the points that I would make is that American Zionism choked on one proposition, on one proposition of Zionism everywhere else in the world. Everywhere else in the world, in large measure, Zionism, Zionism involved Aliyah. It involved immigration to Israel. American Judaism, to quote Jacob Neusner, choked on this proposition. It does not mean that there were not American Jews who did and who wish today even to make Aliyah. But in general, it is important to note that what Brandeis identifies here is that for those who wish to go to Israel, I don't know how to phrase this. He didn't use this phrase. It's fine for those who wish to go, but in large measure, they would be, as he states elsewhere, our day class A kinsmen. In other words, Jews outside of America may well need the protection that an Israel affords, but American Jews will not. On the other hand, the spirit can develop there not only those Jews, but all, all Jews will be benefited and the long, perplexing Jewish problem will at last find solution. Here you have a tremendous degree of optimism that Herzl and others expressed, <laughs> that if we just had a Jewish state, it's quasi-messianic or maybe fully messianic, we would not have problems with anti-Semitism and the hatred of Jews in the world or the problems that Jews feel about uh, not being completely at home in many civilizations would no longer exist. I'm not sure if you're aware, but it didn't exactly work out uh, that way for a whole variety of reasons. But then here comes the key part. Let no American imagine that Zionism is inconsistent with patriotism. Multiple loyalties are objectionable only if they are inconsistent. A man is a better citizen of the United States for also being a loyal citizen of his state and of his city or of being loyal to his college. So those of you who will be students at American University and those of you who are graduates, just remember when the dean writes you a letter of solicitation, you need to be loyal to your university and your college. 
Every American Jew who aids in advancing the Jewish settlement in Palestine, though he feels that neither he nor his descendants will live there, American Jews, according to Brandeis, aren't going to make Aliyah, will nevertheless be a better man and a better American for doing so. There is no inconsistency, none between loyalty to America and loyalty to Jewry. The key point that I want to make at the very outset of this keynote lecture that you're going to explore is that American Zionism then is built on two poles. One, that Jewish life in the diaspora is plausible, not only plausible, it is, as it were, a kind of blessing. American Jews have no need to make Aliyah and that there is no inconsistency whatsoever between the values that Israel embodies and the values, let's say, as he writes elsewhere, of our American Puritan ancestors, namely the democratic and Western values that the United States embodies from our Enlightenment tradition and the values that Israel puts forth are precisely one and the same. By the way, if you want a good expression of this liturgically, I don't know how many of you here are conservative Jews, uh, but some of you may know there's a 1985 Siddur, a prayer book of the conservative movement called Seem Shalom. Have many of you seen that? How many know this prayer book? So Seem Shalom, in 2001 it was reprinted, Seem Shalom. I call the second edition Slim Shalom. It's, <laughs> it's much, much thinner. But there is a significant change that was made, and I'll just add this parenthetically. In the 85 edition of Sidur Sim Shalom, there's a perfect expression of Brandeis's position. In the Musaf, the additional service prayer, it says, Yiratzon melefanecha, may it be pleasing before you, O God, shetalenu v'simcha liartzenu v'titaenu bigvulenu, may you cause us to rise up in joy and replant us within our borders, and then God is thanked, hameshiv banim ligvulam. God has restored the people Israel to its ancient ancestral borders. In this 1985 conservative Sidur, with the addition of this phrase, the conservative movement expresses its positive attitude towards the religious, <laughs> the religious, not secular, but religious significance of the state of Israel. But at the end of that prayer, they add another line. May you accept in joy, may you willingly accept, gladly accept the prayers of the people Israel wherever they dwell. It's good that we have a state of Israel, but it's all right for Jews to live in the diaspora. In fact, God hears your prayers everywhere. By the way, there was an objection made to this by Zionist-oriented members of the conservative movement. So if you look, and I know all of you will run out who are conservative Jews, in the 2001 edition, that line is excised from the prayer book because the notion was there were a lot of complaints that it expressed a non-Zionist kind of position that we shouldn't say that God should hear our prayers everywhere, but we should just keep in mind the new notion of the centrality of Israel. But what I think becomes important here is that that prayer book basically expresses Brandeis's position. So the proposition that I want to begin with tonight is that American or diasporan Zionism not only rests upon the notion that it is all right to live outside of the state of Israel, which I don't think is such a tremendously controversial proposition today, but it stands on the foundation, on the foundation that the values of what this Jewish state will be and the values of the state of Israel are absolutely identical, and there will be no inconsistency between them. Every argument you hear about Israel representing a beacon of Western democracy in an otherwise, and you can fill in the adjective, problematic Middle Eastern world is a reflection of exactly the position that Brandeis put forth. So let's just hold this in mind because where I want to get eventually is that 
this position for all the reasons that Michael Brenner stated in his introduction are more problematic today than they were a hundred years ago and I would contend even 50 years ago and I'll try to outline what I think some of those reasons are. Now I want to take you way back to the Talmud because I do want to get to the whole point in a moment of religious nationalism in Israel. Religious nationalism and the settlements that emerge as a result of a certain kind of religious messianic ideology that will begin to take significant hold in Israel, particularly post-1967, post Mohammed Sheshat Hayamim, the Six-Day War. First, you should note that in general, rabbinic Judaism was, I would say, politically quiescent politically quiescent. That is to say, rabbinic Judaism asserted that the Jews would not attempt en masse politically to return to their ancestral homeland. The idea of Shivat Zion, a return to Zion, was completely central to classical Judaism. All one has to do is look at any prayer book. Bring us forth from the four corners of the earth and cause us to walk upright into our land. Uh, praise to you, O God. Praise to you, God, who causes the divine presence to return to Zion. Restore our judges as they were at first etc. There was a religious notion of Shivat Zion, of return to Zion, and had there not been this religious notion about the centrality of the land of Israel in Jewish thought, the modern Zionist movement of a secular variety would not have been able to build upon what I'm going to now call the religious myth of classical rabbinic Judaism. But it is important to note that after the destruction of the Second Temple, and with the fall of Matsada, Yavna, which was the site at the end of the first century where Yohanan ben Zakkai led the Jewish people so that the Jewish people could survive the political destruction of their state by the Romans in the first century, Yavna became the dominant motif or the dominant symbol in Jewish thought for almost 1,800 years. Note what Yavna represents. And by the way, to see how out of keeping the Yavna myth is with the state of Israel, let me ask you, how many in this room have been to Israel? How many of you have visited Matsada when you're in Israel? How many of you have gone to Yavna? Okay, more than I might have thought, but about a tenth, I would say, of the other people. Matsada is clear what it stands for. The Jews lost their political power. Leolam lotipo Matsada owed. Matsada will never fall again. What happens? It's sort of Matsada represents the same view. I grew up in Virginia, Patrick Henry. What was his famous line? Give me, give me liberty or give me death. Matsada represents the fact that the Jews need political military power. There's no question about it. On the other hand, what was Yavna about? You have Yochanan ben Zakkai, the great leader of the Jewish people, who simply says to Vespasian, Tain li Yavna v'chochameha, give me Yavna and its sages. We're just going to go sit in a yeshiva and study, so to speak. Political quiescence, it's a different kind of ethos. The warrant for this in the Talmud is found in Ketubot 110b and 111a. It's the Shalosh Shavuot. Israel is said to have made three oaths before God. And the main one is that Israel will not go up Shaloya Alu Kachoma. Israel will not go up altogether as if surrounded by a wall. In other words, rabbinic Judaism taught that to believe that the Jews could politically create their own state was a sin. It was a sin because it represented choser emunah, how should I put this, bahashem. I could say it other ways. It represented a lack of faith in God. Who was going to restore the people? 
God was going to restore the people. And if the Jewish people did anything politically to engage in a mass aliyah, it represented a lack of faith in God. That dominated traditional Jewish thought for centuries, though there were other lines. And indeed, you begin to get notions of adchalta de geulta, and this will be important, or aruta militata, uh, awakening from below that begin to emerge. And let me just read a passage from the Zohar on page two. Rabbi Judah began and said, who is she that looks forth at the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? Who is she that looks forth? That refers to Israel. When the Holy One, blessed be, he raises them up and brings them out of exile, he will open for them an extremely fine and small opening of light. Then he will open for them a slightly larger opening, and later still, he will open for them the heavenly gates that open to the four corners of the world. Among the rabbis who paid a great deal of attention to this was a great rabbi, the first chief Ashkenazic rabbi of Israel, Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook. Rabbi Cook followed in the path of a man named Svi Hirsch Kalisher. Kalisher lived from 1795 to 1874. So Pam or Michael, when you're testing your students, you'll have all the right dates. Rabbi Kalisher wrote a book in 1862, Drishat Sion, Seeking Zion. And he opposed this notion of the three O's. He was influenced by the rise of nationalism in Europe in the 19th century, and he took a line from scripture where it said, Shuvu Eli va'ashuva alechem. You return to me and I will return to you. Rabbi Kalisher wrote, People who think that there's going to be a great miraculous redemption are wrong. Redemption will come through the efforts of the Jewish people, or to phrase it differently, God is going to use the Jewish people as his agents to make the creation of a Jewish state, or if one doesn't like state, at least some kind of Jewish entity in the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people possible. Rabbi Kalisher was the first, or among the first, Orthodox rabbis to justify, I guess I would call it for our purposes, political action in order to see to it that a Jewish state would be reborn. And Rabbi Cook, if you look on the second page, who lived from 1865 to 1935, wrote the following. Most of the adherents of the present national revival maintain that they are secularists. The Ben-Gurions of Israel, if you were to talk to them, would tell you they were secular. But the truth is, according to Rabbi Cook, based on these passages, they were wrong. In other words, they thought, they thought about themselves as secularists, but they actually weren't. They were actually agents of God. If Jewish secular nationalism was really imaginable, then we would indeed be in danger of falling so low as to be beyond redemption. But Jewish secular nationalism is a form of self-delusion. This is not my topic tonight, but I would only say the following. Rav Cook was greatly praised as being extremely, extremely tolerant. On one level, he was. He would sit with non-Orthodox Jews, and in fact was there at the opening of the Hebrew University, would talk to secular kibbutznikim, etc. But he never affirmed that they were correct in their views. He sat with them because unbeknownst to them, they were really God's agents in the world. They thought they were secular, but they were really doing God's work. In other words, he affirmed them, but only from his own standpoint. The spirit of Israel is so closely linked to the spirit of God that a Jewish nationalist, <laughs> and I suspect there are a few of you in this room tonight, no matter how secularist his intention may be, must be, despite himself, they must affirm the divine. I don't know what Felix Posen would say about that, but that's Rav Cook's view. To oppose Jewish nationalism is not permissible, for the spirit of God and the spirit of Israel are identical. No, it's not the spirit of democracy and the spirit of Israel are identical. The spirit of God and the spirit of Jewish nationalism are identical.
Men of faith must work all the harder at the task of uncovering the light and holiness implicit in our national spirit, the divine element which is at its core. The secularist will thus be constrained to realize that they are immersed and rooted in the life of God and bathed in the radiant security, sanctity that comes from above. Forty years later, almost, his son, after the Six-Day War, and I'm going to go back to the 50s, but I'm jumping up to 1967. Michael mentioned the whole movement of Eretz Yisrael HaShlema, Gush Emunim, the Block of the Faithful, what it meant for Israel to inherit all the land on both sides of the Jordan. For all I know, from the Nile to the Euphrates, you need to see the words of his son. Now here I want to be very careful. I am not attempting remotely to make an argument that the senior Rav Cook would have moved in the way that his son did. I have no idea. It's a little bit like arguments about on the 20th anniversary of the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin. What would Rabin have said if he were here today the truth is, who knows? I mean, I, I have my own views, but how can you know? Here, I want to be clear. I'm not attempting to say that the father's views or that the son's views were identical to the father's and if he would have interpreted the Six-Day War in the way that the son did. But this much, I would say, there is an element of the thought we just read that comes to find expression in what Michael labeled the religious messianic nationalism of Tzvi Yehuda Cook and his followers. Note what Rabbi Cook, the younger Rabbi Cook, writes in 1968, right after the Six-Day War. The Jewish people have been brought here, severed from the depths of exile to come to the state of Israel. The blood of six million represents a substantial excision from the body of the nation. Six million Jews who died in the Holocaust. This was a substantial excision from our body. Our whole people had to undergo heavenly surgery at the hands of the Mahorsim, the destroyers. May their names be blotted out. God's people had clung so determinedly to the impurity of foreign lands. This is not exactly the way Brandeis viewed American life, Jewish life in America. Here, what happened? The Jews clung to the life, uh, the impurity of foreign lands, that when the end time arrived, they had to be cut away with the great shedding of blood. From Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook's point of view, what was the Holocaust about? The Holocaust was appropriately divine excision in order to make the people Israel worthy later of redemption. I'll leave that for your course in Holocaust studies to judge uh, the correctness of that view. This cruel excision reveals our real life, the rebirth of the nation and the land, the rebirth of Torah and all that is holy. These historical, cosmological, divine facts must be seen as such. The state of Israel is divine. Not only must there be no retreat from a kilometer of the land of Israel, on the contrary, we shall conquer and liberate more and more. I think you could call him an ideologue. I think that would be correct. We are stronger than America, stronger than Russia. With all the troubles and delays we suffer, our position in the world, in the world of history, the cosmic world, is stronger and more secure in its timelessness than theirs. Heaven protect us from weakness and timidity. And our divine world-encompassing undertaking there is no room for retreat. This leads to a certain kind of religious, messianic fervor among a certain group of Israelis. And I want to again be very, very clear. The secular nationalism that is represented by people like Jabotinsky and others does not have one thing in common in terms of its roots with that of religious messianism, but read Jabotinsky. The goal of Zionism is Eretz Yisrael, a single state on both sides of the Jordan River. Eretz Yisrael, all this land and all that is glorified in it, 
belongs to us, to the people of Israel. The odd thing about post-1967 is that you had a certain kind of secular nationalism and religious nationalism for totally different motivations nevertheless coalesce in the notion that what would become the occupied territories or the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, label it any way you want, genuinely belonged to the Jewish people. And that is how, as it were, a kind of an alliance was made. And one has to also keep in mind that the Labor Party, however much it may not have fully embodied an affirmation of these propositions, was really the one that began settlements in the West Bank. So I think as an historian, the one difference I would say between, let's say, the policies of labor and the policies later of the Likud government is that one quietly went about the work of settlements and the other really very openly applauded it. But I think there was in Israel a genuine elation that began to take place after 67. Let's go back then to 1950. In 1950, there was a very famous exchange between Jacob Blaustein, who was the head of the American Jewish Committee, and David Ben-Gurion, who was the Prime Minister of the Jewish State. And this is what Blaustein writes. And I'll, let me just read, well, let me read the first, beginning of the first paragraph. The long-range program in which the American Jewish community can have faith should be based on the following creed. The American Jewish community has confidence in the strength of American ideals and institutions and the soundness of attitudes of American Jews. Compare that to Rav Cook. There's a difference. We shall work with men of goodwill to expand American democracy and to make the actual facts of American life more closely resemble the ideal. We shall work with others to build a Jewish communal life in the U.S. even more closely in tune with American ideals and with the vital traditions of Judaism. The ideals of America and the ideals of Judaism are identical. Identical. And that is why... Uh, Brandeis can make the affirmation that he makes, and you see it here again in Blaustein. And it's why, among certain groups of American Jews, they are particularly committed to showing that virtually every positive ideal in Western society, democracy, enlightenment, all have Jewish roots. It may have some Jewish roots. I would never deny that. But there is a strong ideological thrust that leads American Jews to make that affirmation. We shall give every friendly aid to Israel in its program of adjusting its influx of immigrants to a democratic and constructive way of life. The key point I want to make is that Blaustein, even as he chokes on the idea of Aliyah, for American Jews, nevertheless, what he has in common with Brandeis and what most American Jews share in some measure all the way to the present day, though hardly all anymore, is that democratic values and Jewish values and the values of the state of Israel are all one and the same. There is a commitment to democratic values. Note how Ben-Gurion responds. The Jews of the U.S. as a community and as individuals have only one political attachment, and that is to the United States of America. By the way, Blaustein and others were quite surprised that Ben-Gurion responded in this way, but I'll leave that for another time. They owe no political allegiance to Israel. The state of Israel represents and speaks only on behalf of its own citizens. Prime Minister Netanyahu took a different position, some of you may know, in France, but I won't uh, go into that uh, at this moment and in no way presumes to represent or speak in the name of Jews who are citizens of any other country. We, the people of Israel, have no desire and no intention to interfere in any way with the eternal affairs of Jewish communities abroad. And finally, let me say a word about immigration. We'd like American Jews to come and take part, but in the end, we feel that they'll have a fulfilling life should they come to Israel, but should they not? All right. In a very real sense, in this particular episode, Ben-Gurion yielded to Blaustein. 
Now, this is the other point I want to make. In the 1950s, even after the Suez Crisis, and here's someone like Calvin I know could speak to this sociologically, when American Jews were in, what is it, Lakeville or Lakewood, the Lakeville study, were asked, is Israel central to your concerns? 31% said yes. This is 1957, after the Suez Crisis. 31% said Israel was central to their concerns. In 1968, right after the Six-Day War, when the same study was repeated, 91% said Israel was central to their concerns as Jews and as human beings. The state of Israel began to occupy an even larger place in the minds of average American Jews post-67 than it did from 48 to 67. But the ideal of this democratic notion remained at the very foundation and core of American Zionism. I want to now read on the last page just a, two paragraphs from a book that was written by Abraham Joshua Heschel. How many of you have heard of Rabbi Heschel? Okay, good. I would think. Note his title, Israel, an Echo of Eternity. For those of you who know about Rabbi Heschel's thought, Heschel viewed Judaism as a religion of time, or to phrase it differently, timelessness. He had a very hard time dealing with Judaism as a religion of space. Land was a much more difficult problem for him theologically to deal with. But after the Six-Day War, he went and visited Israel, visited with people like Ben-Gurion and others, and then he wrote his book, Israel, an Echo of Eternity. And I just repeat this one story because of recent events and because it reflects, in this case, a certain kind of American optimism about what could or would be done. In other words, for all of his roots as the scion of a great Hasidic dynasty and his writings on Jewish religion, I would even make the claim here that he writes very much as an American Jew. Doesn't mean there aren't Israeli Jews who wouldn't share this, but it's quintessentially typical of American Jews. It's typical of America. There is a kind of optimism. All problems are solvable. Think of President Kennedy's inaugural address in 1961 in this very town. Our problems are man-made. Human beings can resolve them. Men made these problems, and I would add women. Men and women can resolve them. There is a kind of optimism, an enlightenment kind of optimism about perfectibility. So this is what Heschel writes towards the end of his book. Encouraged by British policies in Palestine, which had the effect of fostering friction and antagonism between Jews and Arabs, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Mohammed Amin El Husseini, launched an attack by Arab nationalists against Jews of the old city of Jerusalem in 1920. The Jews in the old city defended themselves. This prompted the Mufti to renew the riots in the following spring. The situation threatened to develop into a full-fledged war between Jews and Arabs. It took the courage of one person to stop the riots and call an end to the disturbances. He was Rabbi Ben Sion Meir Chai Uziel. Rabbi Uziel became the first chief Sephardic rabbi of the state of Israel. Rabbi Uziel, standing alone in no man's land between the two fighting camps and addressed himself thus to the Arab rioters, our dear cousins, our common father Abraham, the father of Isaac and Ishmael, when he saw that his nephew Lot was causing him trouble, claiming there wasn't enough room for both his flocks and Abraham's to live together, said to him, let there be no quarrel between me and you, between your shepherds and my shepherds, for we people are like brothers. We also say to you, this land can sustain us all, provide for us in plenty. Let us then stop fighting each other for we too are people like brothers. And the Arabs who listened to his words in silence dispersed quietly. 
I think that represents kind of optimistic vision as to how the problems might be resolved. I don't know that it would happen today in exactly this way. My point in telling the story, it may be historically accurate. I leave it to others who have greater knowledge than I have here. But it represents a certain kind of American optimism, represents the notion that fairness, rationality. In a way, you mentioned Alt Neuland. After all, if you read parts of Herzl's book, what does Herzl say? There's going to be prosperity for everyone. Look at Shimon Peres. Everyone's going to be prosperous, of course. Everyone's going to be happy. Uh, there may be some problems, but they can all be overcome. And it represents a kind of American liberal optimism. That's why I brought it in here for tonight. What becomes significant is that post-67, you begin to get other kinds of issues that develop in Israel. The settlements continue to expand. Clearly, a number of the settlers go into the occupied territories, into Judea and Samaria, because what is it they want? They want cheap housing. They would have gone anywhere. But others are really ideologically motivated by exactly the religious messianism that continues to grow in Israel that Michael Brenner mentioned at the beginning. And you begin to get certain developments in Israeli society. And therefore, I just want to quote two people and then try to sum up what I think are some of the challenges that we have today. Peter Beiner, who of course is known to all of you, and this was from the paper that I actually wrote. Michael said there'd be published papers, so I took one part from what I wrote. In his off-quoted essay in the New York Review of Books writes, that most American Jews, especially young ones, are liberal. For all the issues that some people in the establishment seem to have with President Barack Obama, 70% of Jews, at least in the United States, voted Democratic. And my bet will be in the 2016 elections, it's likely to be even a higher percentage voting for the Democratic candidate. This means they believe in open debate. They're skeptical about military force and they possess a basic commitment to human rights. The Zionism they affirm and find attractive is one that recognizes Palestinians as deserving of dignity and capable of peace, and they are quite willing to condemn an Israeli government that they feel do not share these beliefs. I hope everyone understands I am not attempting to take a position on whether Beinert is substantively correct or incorrect about the Israeli government, but I do think he describes a great many young American Jews in a completely unscientific survey, completely unscientific, based on the one class I'm teaching this semester at Brandeis with 24 young people in it. Eight of them belong to, what is it, J Street U. These are all children who are graduates of Jewish day schools, most of them 12 years, quite fluent in Hebrew. I don't know if they're typical or atypical, sociologically speaking, but I don't get the feeling that they are completely atypical of many of our youngsters in this kind of way. And then note what Noam Pianko, a young and articulate professor, when you're 68, anyone under 50 is really young, uh, <laughs> at the University of Washington in his important book, Zionism and the Roads Not Taken, observes, there's a fundamental divide between American Judaism and Israeli nationalism when it comes to the relationship between Jewish and universal concerns. American Jews, particularly the majority affiliated with liberal denominations, emphasize the universal liberal values of social justice, equality, and tolerance as the fundamental message of Judaism. While Zionism always saw itself as promising universal and democratic values, Pianko asserts the realities of creating a Jewish state created existential threats that made the practice of preserving both Judaism and democracy a complicated endeavor. And now let me just try to sum up and then we'll be able to have a discussion or you can all give counter speeches. That'll be your opportunity. I always like answer and answer sessions at the uh, end of a talk. Uh,
I looked to my friend David Myers, who's in this audience. And when David wrote the foreword to one of his books where he entitled Between Jew and Arab, the writings of Shimon Ravidovich, a great scholar who was first head of the Near Eastern and Judaic Studies Department at Brandeis. This book, Between Jew and Arab, is a document, interestingly, that Ravi Dovich would not publish during his lifetime. But it basically said that the real test of Jewish virtue was going to be how were the Jews in Israel going to treat its Arab population. And David writes in there, and here, David, I'm using you as a datum, uh, that it was as a student at Tel Aviv University in the 1980s after the now you need to pick the word carefully, I'll just say the conflict in Lebanon, that you write that you began to doubt some of the Zionist narrative on which you had been raised that really was nurtured or that sprung from the position of Brandeis, I would claim, earlier in the century. Part of what we need to note is that over the last 38 years or so, 40 years, and with the increase in settlements, for all the reasons that Michael said at the very, very outset, the issue of Israel as a democratic and Jewish state has come to be uh, problematized, I think, in the American Jewish mind. Has come to be problematized in the American Jewish mind. Uh, I am not attempting to hear, create, or attempt to say that the enemies of the state of Israel are inherently virtuous. Indeed, I have a lot of my own positions on this that are probably, in light of the talk I'm giving, maybe surprisingly to the right of what some of you might anticipate. I won't go into my whole biography, but descriptively, in light of what you've asked me to speak about, the rise and the expansion of settlements in the West Bank are certainly highly problematic for any number of young American Jews. And in terms of the future of Israel diaspora, particularly American diaspora and relations, the continued growth of settlements in the West Bank will make Israel, as it were, more and more distant to any number of young American Jews. Here, I think descriptively, Beinert is correct, even as I'm going to speak for myself, and here I'm repeating arguments that go on in my home all the time with my own children. I think that a number of these people, I'll just speak about my children, don't sufficiently appreciate what I'm going to call the security risks that the state of Israel has to confront. But if you're interested in the ongoing connection between Israel and diasporan Jewry, which is what you asked me to speak about, you would be foolish not to be aware of this and to know that in some way it does not need to be addressed by the American Jewish community as we move into the 21st century. In other words, however unfair one may feel some of the charges are against Israel and despite the great pride, so many of us take in all sorts of issues or developments and accomplishments of the state of Israel the settlements and the occupied territories will continue to be a moral problem with which this, not only the state of Israel will have to wrestle, but in terms of ongoing relationship between Israel and American Jewry, it will continue to grow, I think, as an impediment to ever stronger relationships between American Jews and Israel, diaspora Jewry and Israel, as we move forward precisely because on some level, fairly or unfairly, you have a number of Jews who think that it betrays the democratic values that they feel ought to lie at the heart, at the heart of the Jewish state. The other issue that emerges is one that probably won't surprise you, but I think, given my own position in the world, but I think will continue to be more and more of an issue. As not only, I would say, right-wing nationalist forces, whether secular or religious, continue to grow strong in Israel, the issue of how non-Orthodox religious denominations or religion is treated in the Jewish state also promises to be a problem. It promises to be a problem because, by and large, in North American Jewry, and now I'm going to say whether you like the number at 60%, 70%, or 80%, 
I'm going to say now scientifically as a sociologist, it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> the overwhelming majority of American Jews marry people who were born non-Jewish. Under the law of return, these people would have a right to automatic citizenship in the Jewish state, but these people will not have the right to be married or buried as Jews in the state of Israel. More and more liberal Jews in North America, in this sense, will be, see themselves as disenfranchised by the state of Israel itself. The issue of religious recognition of non-Orthodox streams and non-Orthodox conversions in the state of Israel is, I want to contend, a foreign policy problem of the state of Israel. I contend it's a foreign policy problem of the state of Israel. It's a foreign policy problem because North American Jews are going to feel increasingly disenfranchised. My bet would be if we looked around this room, For those of you who are Jewish, a large number of your children and grandchildren would not be recognized if you're Jewish as Jews in the state of Israel. If one thinks that that ultimately will not have a deleterious impact on the relationship between diaspora and Israeli Jewry, I think you make a mistake. Now keep in mind most Israeli Jews either were descended from people from Eastern Europe or Russia where they knew nothing of religious denominationalism, or from a Dota Mizrach, from the Oriental communities, that knew nothing of it. Denominational identification of Jews is exclusively a Western and even more a North American phenomenon. But it leads to what is an increasing distance between even secular Israeli Jews, who if they haven't lived in countries like the United States, find it astounding that there are Jews in the United States and a large Jewish community that is simply not orthodox or that views itself, not only a religious community, that views itself in terms that are really far removed from how it is that Jews in a country like Israel identify themselves. So that all of these come to be issues that I think are significant for us to appreciate. And as someone who is concerned about the ongoing ties between Israel, the state of Israel, and the North American Jewish community in particular, and diaspora and Jewry in general, I think these are all issues that need to concern us a great, great deal. And some tikkunim, some amendments, repairs, need to be made as we move into the 21st century, if in the end what we desire is that the ties that have traditionally marked Jewry throughout the world will ultimately come to be achieved. Here, I just end by quoting or a, appealing to a metaphor and image that Shimon Ravidovich created in the 1930s. Ravidovich did choose to live ultimately in Waltham for a variety of reasons and not in Israel. But he wrote in Hebrew, but what's also interesting he did reject a Zionist notion, even from a Chad Ha'am of Merkaz HaRuchani, of a spiritual center. But instead, he used the notion of an ellipsis to symbolize the unity of the Jewish people. An ellipsis has neither beginning nor end, but rather every point on the line is connected one to the other. And it seems to me that for those of us who affirm this kind of notion, and look to Jewish peoplehood in this kind of way, we have a great deal at stake as we move into the 21st century and as we consider the hope and the reality and the accomplishments that Israel represents to so many of us. So I thank you for listening so attentively, and now you can all tell me what I left out or what I didn't state properly. Michael, how do you want me to handle it? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much for it's on. Thank you so much for this brilliant talk. I just have a specific question. When you look at Israel today, 
and the changes that are happening. You look at the Tali school system. Yes. I'm wondering if that is alleviating in some sense edu I mean, you can walk down Emek Lafayim and go shul shopping from one shul. Yeah, so I mean, the question that's asked, aren't there changes in Israel itself? And the answer, of course, is yes. The Hebrew Union College alone and Machon Shechner, the Masorti uh, school that ordains rabbis, the conservative one, ordained over 100 rabbis in the last decade, Israelis, within Israel. Uh, there are today, uh, well, members of reform and conservative congregations only number paid dues members, about not even 10,000. But there are over 100 reform and conservative congregations. Remember, in Israel, unlike America, you have no establishment clause. So that people in Israel, religious institutions generally, are supported by, uh, by the state and that's seen as legitimate and non-Orthodox expressions don't receive that kind of uh, support. But what is interesting is in a recent poll, people were asked to identify themselves by denomination. I think it's a little bit like going to Mars and asking the question, but <laughs> what's fascinating is in the most recent poll, 12% said they identified as reform or conservative. Now this is what I think it means. I think they know that the Haredim hate reform and conservative Judaism. <laughs> so kind of the enemy of my enemy is what I want to be. Uh, but a number of them, 60% said they would like non-Orthodox rabbis to be given the right to perform conversions that would be recognized by the state for matters of personal status. The Tali schools that represent enrichment, where the reform and conservative movements send people in to teach, are growing all over the state. There, there are a lot of tremendous uh, movement that has been made. Having said that, the possibility that the government of Israel will particularly in any recent time uh, move to a full recognition of non-Orthodox expressions uh, I don't think we really live in Mashiach Zeitin uh, <laughs> at this moment. Yes? Well, I mentioned a couple of things. Um, Stand up. The thought that passed in my mind overall is to what extent are the younger people, if you will, younger Jews, especially universities, receiving information to understand basically the history, both sides of what's going on. Uh, you use the words. Um, the uh, settlements have the expansion of the settlements, but in actuality, there have been no new settlements built in Israel in better than the last 20 years. Yes, there have been expansion within existing places where families have grown, and yes, there was a moratorium, and that was gone. But how many students are aware, for example, that there were five attempts at establishing a two-state solution? Yes. And all of them turned down, even uh, Arafat, 94%, Omer. So what extent are students being told there is that side of it too? Then the other thing is, if you look at history, you will discover that most all of these settlements, and that's become a pejorative word, most all settlements, not all, the Israeli government has torn down what they consider to be illegitimate settlements will, built on land that did not belong to Jews. So, yeah, that's been going on. But most all of the settlements... I, I think we have a few more questions in the room, so... so all of the settlements were Jewish communities for centuries, except during the period 1948 to 67. Yeah. And during, so my question is, and I'll say it again, I'll ask it again. I want to know why the students aren't being given this information to evaluate the history of the area. Many of those settlement communities are mentioned in both the Hebrew Bible and in the right. Christian Bible. Jesus walked in many of those. So I think the answer to your question is that more and more people are being informed, and I think that the creation of centers for Israel studies attempt to present uh, balanced portraits of this. Hi. My name is Mackenzie Freudenreich. I'm a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences. And my question was, in your opinion, how do we as college students living in the diaspora expand the discussion that we're having with our peers beyond the decisions of current political leadership? 
into the history and into discussions of Israeli cultural life and that exchange between the two communities. Yeah, no, look, I think that's an important uh, thing. I think there are a lot of such programs that do exist. Uh, and I think that what one has to do is to approach uh, different foundations, programs. I would imagine that the Hillel here, I would hope, at American University provides many such options for, uh, for students. And I think programmatically, it's very important uh, for students to be aware of what all of these other alternatives are. And I think some of the complexity that this gentleman referred to in the whole situation would become more, uh, more evident. But I mean, I, I think in this way, you have lots of Zionist organizations certainly from birthright on, that are attempting to massa, that are attempting to create these kinds of opportunities beyond the political uh, to cultural and other kinds of exchanges. Yes, please. And Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, my question relates to a statement. Identify yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Zach. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and I study Israel there. Um, what my are you question writing your dissertation on? I'm you know? writing my dissertation, uh, well, who knows what it will be, it's, it's still in the early stages, but my idea right now is to write on Mizrahi participation in settlements in the West Bank and Gaza. Okay. Um, so my question relates to a statement that you made kind of in the middle. You said, I'll leave it be, but the title of your talk is on, you know, the history of the relationship of the diasporas, so why not right. ask it about um, Bibi's statements in uh, France, which I think he also made in Denmark to the perhaps irritation of the local communities there. Can you describe the process by which the Israeli secularly elected or secularly chosen government uh, changed its position from the one articulated by Ben-Gurion in which it did not speak for diaspora jury to one in which it did? And did Ben-Gurion maintain the distinction that you're thinking about in uh, the distinction between the American diaspora and other diasporas? Look, Thanks. I think Ben-Gurion's great question, and I suspect there are people here who can answer it with greater authority than I can. Look, one of the problems with taking a quote in general <laughs> is that I could bring you other quotes that might present a different kind of view. In light of my topic tonight, Idavka, I especially selected the Blaustein Ben Gurion statement in 1950. There are other statements of Ben Gurion that would be a bit different. This is just speculation on my part, and believe me, with the people here tonight, others could answer it much more authoritatively than I could. Uh, I think there have been a couple of differences. I think, particularly post 67, for all the reasons that I talked about, where Israel comes to be the center as it were, or a central concern to Jews throughout the diaspora. I don't know how to put it. I think the reality is that Israel is at the very center of the Jewish world. The reality is, take for example even the religious issue. For most American Jews, it won't have really much practical impact whether the state of Israel fully recognizes the Jewishness of most American or diasporan Jewish children. But given the central, central role that Israel plays in the life of the Jewish people, it, it is a tremendously delegitimizing statement about the authenticity of diasporan Jewry, which bothers people incredibly uh, in the diasporan community. In other words, the very central role, the centrality of Israel, my last quote from Ravi Dovich aside rhetorically, the central role that Israel plays means that what would be regarded as the delegitimization uh, of the forms of Judaism with which most diasporan Jews identify is tremendously, tremendously problematic. But from your point of view, from the point of view of your question, one of the things you have to note is just the demographic difference. At the time when Ben-Gurion made that statement, a minority of Jews worldwide actually lived in the state of Israel. Today, Israel is the largest Jewish community in the world, and it promises to grow even larger. And the reality is that in terms of the centrality that Israel plays, to some degree, I suspect there are many Jews, even in a latent sense, who think that the prime minister of the Jewish state, I don't know, king of the Jews would be too strong a term, but 
that would be way too strong a term. But there is a sense in which what I think Netanyahu has come to express is probably um, the expression of belief, I'm sure, that he genuinely holds. That I have no doubt about. But the reality is when the state of Israel speaks, it does represent on some level, consciously or beyond, uh, Jewish life in the larger world in a significant kind of way. And given the demographic changes that have occurred in world Jewry, it doesn't surprise me that the prime minister of the Jewish state would think in this way. Keep in mind, too, that one of the purposes of the state of Israel was to provide for the defense of the Jewish people. And that, and certainly the whole purpose of Chok HaShvut, of the law of return, is to look at the state of Israel uh, in much larger terms than the state itself, and to see it as a protector of the Jewish people, as it were, worldwide. Uh, you know, it's interesting, if you were to even look at the question of who is a Jew, you know, the most interesting iteration of the law of return, in my opinion, is the 1970 amendment. Because this came after a number of cases in Israel, where some of you may know there was an Israeli Jew named Shalit, who was married to a non-Jewish woman. At the time, they had identity cards in Israel, and they wanted, they had a la'om and dot, nationality and religion. And Shalit wanted his child registered as a Jew for nationality, but with no religion. So ultimately, after the case was decided by the court, and the Israeli Knesset amended the law in 1970, and Ruti Gavison has written on this, What's fascinating is that ultimately the Knesset, as well as the court, came to affirm what I'm going to call a religious definition of Jewish peoplehood. Keep in mind, Judaism is, and with all the sociologists and scholars here, think of the term an ethnic church, whatever term, nationality. Think in the book of Ruth. When Ruth, the prototypical convert, converts, Amecha mi velokai chelokai, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. Religion as an expression even of Jewish culture and ethnicity, your people will be my people, are inextricably interwoven in Judaism. And in that sense, it just reinforces, in my opinion, the fact that you have in the state of Israel some significant degree of Jewish continuity, regardless of how secularized the state is, so that the, that the prime minister of the state of Israel would ultimately make this statement, diasporan protests on the part of leaders aside, does not surprise me in any kind of way. I mean, the one thing that I didn't mention is that, you know, the other issue, and I was a little hesitant to bring it up, but why not at this point? Uh, The decision made by the Prime Minister to accept the invitation of Speaker Boehner to come, and what we currently have in terms of political divides over the state of Israel, even in this country, one of the things that I really do genuinely fear is that support for the state of Israel may well become at some point a partisan political issue divided by party. That has not been the case up to this uh, juncture, but uh, it does not seem to have been the major concern of Prime Minister Netanyahu. If it was, I'm not sure he would have come to D.C. over the objection of President Obama. But I think all of these issues, uh, you know, are certainly far from resolved and certainly need, I think, further discussion. But ultimately, I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu and maybe other prime ministers of Israel would see themselves in this kind of position as representing the majority of Jews and responsible for their defense throughout the world. I see quite a few more hands. We can't get everyone, um, but I would take three you more. You want to ask maybe three or four more questions? Three more and then collectively and then okay. you know, and, and I would like to start with you. and. Hi, my name is Aaron Torup. I'm a sophomore here at American University. Um, there's been some the discussion. The colors here are red and white, correct? Dave? Red and blue. Red and blue. Oh, but you've uh, got white. Okay. There's been some debate about 
the population numbers in Israel and the potential that in 30 or so years, especially if the West Bank becomes part of Israel in a one-state solution, that Jews will no longer be the majority in Israel. If that were to happen, how do you think that Israel could reconcile its democratic values with its Jewish values? And as a uh, self-professed liberal young American Jew who is very concerned about both democratic ideals and Jewish ideals, it's hard for me to rationalize what could happen and what my response as an American and as a Jew could be in supporting a state that is Jewish but may have to suppress the rights of some of its population to maintain its Jewish status. I can answer that quickly. I don't even have to wait. The answer is it can't. I mean, that would be easy. Yes, uh, my name is Ian Lustig. I'm from uh, University of Pennsylvania. Right. I, I, as, a, as a graduate of Brandeis, I really appreciate your talk, <laughs> but also appreciate in particular your argument that uh, what we can still see as an anchor of the relationship is really on these Brandeis views back before World War I. However, you, uh, I'm wondering what you think of the impact of the other side, what is increasingly powerful, the other side of American Jewish life, Sheldon Adelson, right. Ira Rapport, a member of the Jewish uh, underground. They have different views. Shlomo Waldman, I mean, the rabbis yes. overrepresented in extreme parts of Gush Emunim. So you haven't talked much about right. possible the impact of that part of American diaspora right. uh, relations on Israel. Good, okay. And David? Thank you, David. Um, just a, a comment before a question to jump in on. Oh, David Myers from UCLA. Uh, to jump into, I think, Zach's question, in fact, Ben-Gurion repudiated the Blaustein yeah, agreement did, yeah. uh, immediately after signing that memorandum of understanding and throughout the 50s on many occasions. I purposely kept that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good place to start. Um, so I guess I have a question that follows on, on the last one. Um, and it just is an attempt to really pull out what I think your main point is, but maybe refine it a little bit. Um, because it seems to me that part of what you're arguing is that in the constellation of Zionist thought, America is really an outlier. Yeah. Um, and I want to just sort of pull that out by the following claim. One, Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda and maybe even a Abraham Isaac and Jabotinsky actually may not come from a different ideological uh, bed. Um, that they emerge out of the same moment um, a moment defined by modern nationalism that lent a language, a lexicon, an organizational strategy, a communications means, um, and Haredi, religious, secular alike, all drew from that well. And moving conversely, secularists, devout secularists, borrowed from the messianic energy that, uh, that people like Rav Cook represent. So I'm not so sure that there's, there's a great deal of difference. That's the European strand. And then as distinct from that, and I think if you look at your first source and your last source, right, your first source and your last source, it reveals an arc of American Zionism that is inclusive, that is non-coercive, and uh, pluralist, quite, quite different. Quite pluralist. I guess the, the question ultimately is, um, as you look back on Brandeis, wasn't it self-evident in retrospect that it would be dissonant with that other strand of Zionism, such that Beinart and, and Pianco make great sense. We have a very short intervention. I will be as quick as I can because we're running out of time, but we do have a controversy here. I'm not sure how many people of the, in the room are aware that the Rabbi's Cook, father and son, paradigm is winning hands down today in Israel yes. over all others, including the Jabotinsky liberal nationalism and yes. the Ben-Gurion pragmatic Zionism. And the rabbis cook, unlike Jabotinsky, hail not only from halachic sources, but in their understanding of the new Jewish will to power and divine intervention and inevitable fate, they are based on Rabbi Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel as well. And I would like to draw your explicatory talent to explain what is to me an enigma, how come today the Cook paradigm seems to be winning, winning hands down over all the others. Yeah, I mean, the, actually, all three questions are really related to one another. I mean, what I would say is that uh, the people you mentioned, Ian, 
are really just not concerned with Israel, quite frankly, as a democratic state, whether they're in the United States or whether they're in Israel. That is just not a value that they really share. I mean, and in that sense, in answer to the young man's question, tell me your name again. Aaron. Aaron. It's a good Jewish name. Uh, <laughs> oh, Hev Shalom, Dave Shalom. Okay, never mind. Uh, I would say that uh, what we have seen in Israel increasingly, and David, this will be a discussion that we could have later. I mean, and I'm willing to entertain part of it now. Uh, it could be that the people like Jabotinsky and Rav Cook and the Ben-Gurions of the Jewish world all emerged, it may be true, out of an Eastern European and then early Yeshuv kind of context. But uh, the ideologies that inform them are really radically different. I think in light, Fanya, of your point, I think the real issue is how is it that in the state of Israel you moved principally from what I would call essentially a pragmatic kind of an approach to all sorts of questions to one that is today, I think, much more strongly ideological. Uh, in answer to Aaron's question, in other words, I look at that same demography and think if you end up with only one state, how could, you, how could it not possibly end up being from a universal moral standpoint problematic? I mean, look, what recent events do reveal is that uh, you want to know what one state will look like? This is my opinion. I think a lot of what you get today is what one state might look like Haifa notwithstanding. Uh, but having said that, what I think that some American, young American Jews in particular, don't fully appreciate is what the legitimate security concerns are of the state of Israel. But having made that kind of uh, comment, I don't know, Fanya, if it's really Hegel in a Wild zu Macht, I mean, that leads to this kind of policy that you see expressed in both religious and secular expressions of Jewish nationalism. I mean, it could be that I could draw those sources out, but I, I do think when you read particularly the younger Rav Cook, and again, because I want to be very, very careful, it's very dangerous to go back to the 20s and even early 30s and say what Svi, uh, not Svi Yehuda, but Avram Yitzchak Cohen Cook would have said. I mean, that, but, but there are clearly roots there. I mean, there's no question about that. I think the point that you made about the unleashing of messianism, here'd be the last point I'd make. David Ben-Gurion was really wrong about one principal thing. He thought he could tame Jewish religious messianism. Ben-Gurion believed I can use all the vocabulary of classical messianism Kibbutz Galuyo, Tzur Yisrael, the ingathering of the exiles, the rock of Israel, and I can give them completely secular kinds of meanings. When the Western Wall is conquered, a Kotel HaMa'aravi, you could look at it in two ways. It's a symbol of Jewish national sovereignty from 2,000 years ago, but what is it really? It is a, it is a shul where Haredi rules of decorum are enforced. I bring it up here because what it means is the ability to try to disentangle this ancient powerful religion and secularize it completely from its roots is just simply difficult. I don't know if it's impossible. Maybe it is impossible, but very, very difficult to do. And when Ben-Gurion used all these terms and this vocabulary, he was naive in thinking that its explosive potential wouldn't find later expression. And what we may end up having is really a very core argument at the heart of the Jewish people between people who really are informed by this kind of nationalism on the one hand, and people on another level who are informed by a Brandeisian, 
he'd love to know that I'm including him, Pianko-ish kind of view of what Judaism is all about. And the reality of how one will, how this will evolve in the next 10 to 15 years, the fate of the relationship between American and diasporan Jewry in the state of Israel may really hang in the balance as to how this works out over the next decade or more. Thank you all very, very much, and thank you for the next